Mm -hmm. The two little air raid over Tokyo, Japan, during World War II was a epic and daring event that startled the world. This event was launched on April the 18th, 1942. In all, there were 16 planes involved. Only one of them landed in Russia. And here to tell us about both the Doolittle Raid and the plane that landed in Russia is Colonel Edward J. York, U.S. Air Force, retired. This interview is being conducted by Jim Sweeney at Air Force Village, San Antonio, Texas, on 6 June 1984. Now, it, it's my understanding that the raid was launched from a U.S. aircraft carrier in the Pacific. Am I, am I right in this? Yes, you are, Jim. Uh, I'd like to go back a little in time from the day that, that uh, we were launched from the USS Hornet, which is the carrier that you mentioned, and uh, tell you how I got mixed up in this raid. The, the uh, group that I was a member of, the 17th Bombardment Group, had moved from Pendleton, Oregon to Columbia, South Carolina uh, just a few days actually before I met General Doolittle, who then was a lieutenant colonel. Uh, we were just getting settled at Columbia for what we thought was going to be about a three-month stay uh, when Colonel Doolittle flew in one afternoon and uh, wanted a meeting with the four squadron commanders and the group commander. I was a squadron commander at that time, so we gathered in a room with Colonel Doolittle, shook hands, shut the door, and said, gentlemen, we're going to bomb Tokyo. We, th we thought it was a joke at first. <coughs> However, uh, he outlined the plan very briefly, told us that we, he needed our airplanes. We were one of two groups that, we, that was equipped with a B-25, and we were uh, the first group to be equipped with B-25s, and that was the reason he was there, because logically he thought we had more training than the other group. Uh, he told us roughly that we would have uh, his plan, his thinking, that we would have about 30 days in which to modify the aircraft, do some training, and uh, get ready for the raid. That all this would take place at one of the satellite fields near Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. The reason being that they were. Uh, at that time, there were seven or eight satellite fields up in the boondocks and uh, away from prying eyes, so to speak, because we would be practicing strange takeoffs and uh, might uh, cause people to speculate as to what was going to happen. He told us that he wanted only volunteers for this mission and that we were not to divulge what he had told us about going to bomb Tokyo to anyone, merely to say that it was going to be an exciting a diversion, which would probably take three months, and then we would, they, people would return. Uh, we gathered, I did, with my squadron, got the men all together and uh, asked for volunteers. I spoke first to the enlisted men. Every one of them stuck his hand up after I got through talking. and. Uh, 
then I talked to the officer. However, most of my officers were in Minneapolis having some work done on the airplanes. We did not know why or, or what. There was a civilian contractor was doing some work up there. Later on, well, much later on, found out that he was put, putting special gasoline tanks into the airplanes in preparation for the Doolittle raid. Of course, we, did, we knew nothing about that. Uh, however, I uh, received uh, word from uh, my officers who were up there that every one of them was ready to go wherever we were going. And we proceeded to Eglin Field. At, at Eglin, we uh, marked off in uh, a hundred foot uh, lengths a portion of the runway so that we could judge how long the man would have to roll in order to take off under maximum power conditions. And we eventually got down to where the man was taken off with, with an empty airplane, of course, in about 400 feet. Uh, we crashed one airplane doing it. No one was hurt, however. Uh, we, there was an awful lot of work to be done on the airplanes. We had to put the icer boots on, uh, had to install uh, guns, we had to remove the bottom turret, which we found was unsatisfactory, but just an awful lot of work. Put in special carburetors for long distance crews. When we got through, we uh, took off for California, went to Sacramento, where there was more work to be done. We put new propellers on all the airplanes, because uh, by the time we got there, we had the airplanes all oh, maybe a year <coughs> Propellers were pretty badly made, chewed up. We were in Sacramento about a week, I would judge. And we flew to Alameda, which is very close by, and were put aboard the carrier Hornet. Uh, <coughs> that same day we went aboard the carrier, we uh, sailed out into the middle of San Francisco Bay and dropped the anchor and spent the night there. Uh, I thought it was kind of strange, but we we uh, we were given liberty to go into San Francisco, which we took advantage of, of course. And uh, when we got to the top of the mark, we could look down and see this carrier all lit up, B-25s stacked on the deck because they're too big. The airplanes are too big to be placed in a hangar deck, but, so they had to be right on top. And uh, I guess this is all thought out ahead of time. A rumor probably was spread that we're, they were going to Hawaii with the airplanes to reinforce our troops there. And the next morning, bright sunshine, we sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge, people waving, and, and off we went. Uh, <coughs> while after we had sailed, of course, uh, the announcement was made that we were, we were where we were going. I'm sure that a lot of people had guessed where we were going. But uh, messages were read, one from President Roosevelt, another one from General Marshall, who was Chief of Staff of the Army at the time. And we settled down to a SC routine. Uh, we studied target materials, we listened to lectures by a naval officer who had been an attaché in Japan for three years, telling us about their customs and what would happen uh, if we got caught and so on and so on. Uh, we were at sea 15 days, actually, and with quite a task force. Uh, because in addition to the carrier we were on, there was another carrier, which was operational, of course, we had four heavy cruisers, eight destroyers, and two tankers. Just about all the Navy that the United States had after Pearl Harbor, which is very fresh in our minds, of course. Now, the reason I mention this, uh, uh, we'll, we'll come, up, come up a little later. <coughs> I'd like to mention one thing that I've overlooked. It's a, tremendous secrecy that had to surround this whole mission. 
because uh, if word got out to the wrong people, of course it would be a failure and it would be fatal to those, to those who were going on it. Uh, another little sidelight, which I will mention at this time, was the difficulty in, in procuring supplies that we needed because of the secrecy. For example, in California, we were supposed to pick up our bombs, 500-pound bombs. The Nisha Arsenal, which is near San Francisco, was the supply point. The colonel commanding the Nisha Arsenal would not release any bombs because he said there were only 300 bombs in all the United States, and he wasn't going to give anybody any bombs. It took a phone call to General Arnold in Washington, who dispatched a major general from Spokane down to Sacramento to get the bombs that we were going to use on the raid. The uh, time at sea was rather boring and all routine, of course, but necessary, of course. On the 14th day at sea, the destroyers fell back, and we soon lost sight of them, as did the tankers. The cruisers, the four cruisers, stayed with us. It was explained to us that we were now going to cruise at high speed, and that the other ships which left us would run out of fuel. They couldn't go uh, at that speed for very much distance. So the last day, we were supposed to uh, cruise to within about 400 miles of, of Japan, Tokyo that is. <clears throat> and uh, Colonel Doolittle was going to take off two hours before dark and fly in and drop incendiaries and set Tokyo on fire so that we could home in on it. We would take off just at dark just before dark. Uh, it didn't work out that way. The day of the raid, we were eating breakfast when the uh, public address system started screaming and came out with an order, Army crews man your planes. So that meant only one thing. We were supposed to leave. And we did, about 30 minutes. It took that long, really, to uh, uh, get everything in readiness. One of the things that comes to mind, a little amusing, was that uh, we were issued five pints of, of bourbon whiskey per, crew, per airplane because there were five men in a crew, each crew. When we came aboard the carrier, we had to turn the whiskey into the pharmacy because as we all know, the United States Navy does not permit alcoholic beverages aboard ship. So the last thing we, we did at, before taking off was to go to the pharmacy to retrieve our five pints, which I did too. On landing after the mission, the first thing we did was open one, and it turned out to be colored water. Evidently, the pharmacists were a little thirstier than we, and managed to unseal the, the bottle and uh, take out the whiskey put in some colored water. Fortunately, the other four were all, all right. Uh, to get back, we took off. Uh, every airplane had to take off in the same spot because it was only four, eight feet from the wingtip to the island, and of course the Navy wouldn't let us uh, start back behind the island for fear of running into it and causing a great amount of damage. So uh, we took off. The weather was particularly bad that morning. We were taking water up over the, the uh, bow onto the flight deck, which is approximately 50 feet above the water, up to the, up above the level of the water. <clears throat> However, uh, everyone got off all right. And uh, uh, 
we cruised on in into Japan. And the closer we got, the better the weather was. It, I remember that it was Saturday noon when we made landfall, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky to to hide in. And beautiful weather. The beach had a lot of, where I made landfall had a lot of people. We were waving. Of course, we were right up on the, practically on the water, about 50 feet of altitude, and they obviously thought that we were Japanese airplanes. And we started making our run in. And uh, we'd been trained to pull the airplane up to 1,500 feet before dropping bombs because of concussion have to cause damage to the airplane. So at the proper time, I pulled the thing up 1,500 feet, and we dropped the bombs, and I immediately pushed it back down and forgot about staying there until the bombs went off. So we were rocked a little bit, but not, no damage. And uh, by this time, I would made up my mind not to go to China, but to go to uh, Siberia because uh, of technical difficulties. We had special gas tanks installed with uh, in almost every conceiv conceivable place in the airplane. But the place where the bottom turret used to be had a 50-gallon tank, and we even had 25-gallon cans, tin cans of gasoline, which we could pour into that 50-gallon tank one at a time. However, uh, because of the difficulty, uh, I'd made up my mind that we we would never get close to the shore of China. And uh, I saw no percentage of landing in the ocean. Uh, so I decided to go to Siberia because I knew that we were fighting on the same side in the war, and I thought that we would be refueled when we got there, and then we could proceed to Chongqing and uh, be there at, at the appointed time. Also, it never occurred to me that uh, the weather would get so bad that everyone would either have to ditch or bail out or do some other thing. Uh, we, we flew right across the island of Honshu and then across the, uh, the part of the ocean to the west of it. And, we got to Siberia, and uh, we, had, we had about 45 minutes of fuel left, so I looked around a little bit to see if I could find an airfield, which we couldn't, but there was a huge uh, flat field which was being used at, as an auxiliary field, evidently, and so I made a wheels down landing, and uh, there were two or three people around there. I noticed they didn't have shine eyes, so I thought maybe we were in the right place. The maps, incidentally, that we had were just horrendous as far as accuracy is concerned. They took us into an installation, a naval installation, which was very crude. Of course, everything in that part of the world was crude, we still is. And uh, we got very friendly treatment after two or three hours. Of an interpreter was brought in who would speak English. And I decided not to lie to them about what had happened. I said, we were on a raid on, on Japan earlier today, and they knew that the raid had taken place from uh, their own sources. So, so uh, it wasn't too difficult to, to convince them of that. The next morning, it put us in an airplane, not ours, and took us to a city about 400 miles north of where we were, which was Army headquarters in that, for that part of, of, the, uh, of the country. And we were ushered into the commanding general's office, and but through his interpreter, he said, according to international law, you must be interned. And I thought to myself, oh, damn, we're going to be here two, three days. Well, the internment took place, and we were still at 14 months later, at which time we got out. We weren't in the Far East very long. 
two or three weeks. And uh, of course I was pressuring and uh, fidgeting and so on to get out. And uh, of course in the Soviet Union, no local official ever makes any decision. I, I learned this uh, quite soon, but uh, was confirmed as time went on. Well, without, they refuse to take responsibilities for what matters, because if they uh, make a wrong decision, they're liable to end their careers very quickly. But uh, someone made a decision to put us on, on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and uh, we were on it for 20 days and wound up in European Russia in a city called Penza. We were in Penza <clears throat> for about two months, and life there was pr pretty good. We had food, and we had a uh, bathing facility. We were, of course, under guard. We were told it was for our own good. <clears throat> what they didn't want was for us to be wandering around, wandering around and uh, looking things over. They're very secretive about everything, the slightest matter. That it's just no, no one a asks any questions about anything for fear they might be asking the wrong question to the wrong person. But after about two months, and we were following the war as best we could, this, you, re, you recall, was in 1942 when the Germans were pushing towards the Caucasus and, and they had uh, surrounded Leningrad and uh, it looked real bad for the Russians. And it looked kind of bad for Penza, where we were. So eventually someone decided they'd better get us out of there and they moved us to the northeast to a little village on the Kama River uh, near uh, what was then called the city of Molotov. Of course, when Molotov fell out of favor, they, they changed the uh, name of the city back to Perm, which it had been for a couple hundred years before it became Molotov. And that is where we stayed the most, most of the time, well, approximately nine months. We spent the winter there, as a matter of fact. We were pretty isolated because the only communication with the outside world from there is the river, Kama River, which flows eventually into the Volga. There's no railroad or highway or airplane or anything like that. <clears throat> so uh, we spent the winter there, and the, the, the uh, weather there is very stable through the winter. It never got colder than 55 below zero or warmer than 40 below zero, a spread of 15 degrees. We had a thermometer and without much to do, naturally we seize upon any activity that would uh, uh, use up a little time. Eventually, someone else, someone made another decision and we were moved from there into what they call Central Asia, down in Turkmenistan. Uh, the city of Ashabad, which is the biggest one, the capital. And we stayed in Ashabad, I'd say, about two months. And uh, I suspected all along that the reason we were moved that to Ashabad, which is not very far from the Persian border, I suspected the reason we were moved was that they had made up their minds to allow us to, to leave the country. And eventually, we did leave the country, We're going into uh, Iran, and from there into uh, what was then India, now Pakistan, and we got to Karachi, which where we had an American Air, Air Force detachment, quite a large one as a matter of fact, and eventually got back to the United States. Well, uh, Ed, that is certainly both interesting and very historic. I have a uh, couple of uh, questions I'd uh, 
like you to suffer through if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, for instance, I'd like to uh, uh, have you describe the B-25 uh, airplane that was used in this raid. There were 16 of my understanding. And well, for posterity, for those later on and many years to come, what what sort of a plane was this? It was <coughs> classified as a medium bomber. It was uh, a departure from the traditional design of bombers. And it was built by North American Aviation, which is now Rockwell, North, uh, out California. It was two engine and it had a tricycle landing gear. It was the first airplane that I ever saw with a tricycle landing gear. Its speed uh, averaged, well, indicated airspeed would be about 240 miles an hour. Now, this doesn't seem like much, but when you go from the B-18, with which we were equipped a year before we got the B-25, the B-18 would do about 150 miles an hour. So this was a quantum leap to get an airplane to do 240 or better. It uh, was very uh, maneuverable in flight. It was noisy. That was the worst part of it. You almost drive you crazy uh, with, it, with its noise, but uh, it had so many other virtues that, that uh, you could overlook that. It would carry a smaller bomb load than the old B-18, uh, but uh, sufficient for, for its uh, uh, missions, which of course uh, later in the war it was used extensively in Europe and in the Pacific also. Well, uh, what uh, were these planes uh, painted uh, Black or were they their natural silver color? No, no, they're they're painted uh, with the old army olive drab, uh, same as the army uniforms and trucks and everything else. We were part of the army at that time, you'll recall. Yeah, they were olive drab. I see. Well, now um, it has been given to to me that all the planes that took off were wrecked except yours. Now, am I uh, correct in that? Yes. They all mashed up and landing? That's right, Jim. They, they either crash landed or the crew bailed out. And, and of course, that was the airplane was destroyed in each case. And so some of these people were captured, though, because of their crashed airplanes? Uh, they were captured. Uh, not because of that, but because everyone landed in uh, a part of China that was occupied. Now, when I say this, the Japanese couldn't occupy a country as big as China uh, in, in, the, in a manner which would permit them control of every square foot of ground because it didn't have that many troops. But they would, they had the cities, they had the coastal ports, they had uh, troops on the rail lines, and where it was important. So if you bail out of an airplane, you probably wouldn't fall into the hands of Japanese, mm -hmm. unless you were very unlucky. But you had to, to go from where you landed on the ground, you would have to cross lines that they controlled. Uh, and if they really wanted you, uh, they'd go looking for you. And then, of course, you always had to worry about traitors. Uh, money does a lot of things. And the two crews that were captured were betrayed by Chinese mm -hmm. after they thought they uh, were home free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, how many men were actually on the, the flight. Uh, I've heard figures of uh, 53 or, and I've heard figures of 63. 
that were involved in these 16 planes. Do you have a, an accurate figure in your memory oh, as sure. to how many men there were? Oh, sure. There were 80. 80? 80. Oh. 16 airplanes with five men in each airplane. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So there were 80 people. Uh, I see. Now, when we were getting ready for this thing at Eglin Field, we had 24 airplanes uh -huh. for a couple of reasons. One, we didn't know how many would fit on the deck of this carrier. Mm -hmm. Two, we thought maybe we'd lose some airplanes. We did lose one. Yeah, I see. Well, uh, having seen communism close at hand, which you certainly have, you, you've been there, you've seen it. Uh, what's your general feeling toward communism and towards Mother Russia? And I suppose they're two different things, communism and the Russian people, but what's your feeling toward communism? Well, I think it's a terrible danger for the rest of the world. And uh, it's a system of government and uh, living that is uh, unbelievable to someone who has not experienced it. Uh, you've probably heard often that the best way to make people realize that what a good place they're living here in here in the United States is to send them over to, to Russia for, for a, a month or two and uh, then bring them back. It's, it's almost uh, unbelievable the, the depression that the people suffer from not being able to talk freely with their fellows, not being able to criticize things that are wrong. Uh, <clears throat> the family life is so limited because of, of the congestion, whether it's out in the country or in the cities. Everyone wants to get to Moscow or Leningrad. Everyone, that I ever talked to there, and I learned to speak Russian at, after a certain length of time, so I could talk. Everyone wants to live in the, the cities of Moscow or Leningrad because they're a little bit, uh, the, the uh, way of life there is a little bit more comfortable than it is where, the, where they find themselves. Of course, we didn't get to Moscow or Leningrad, but because they were under siege while we were there, and life was pretty tough. But uh, now, you say that there are two different things, Russians and communism, and that's true. But you recall that they became a communist government in 1917, which is a long time ago. And you can subject a people and a country to a system, if you subject them long enough, say 50 years, 100 years, pretty soon you've lost that country because the older ones die off and the younger ones are born under the system. They know nothing, nothing different. They can't believe I, uh, what you tell them about life in other countries. I, of course, would try to spread propaganda among them as, as much as I could all the time I was there, painting rosy pictures about life in the United States. They, could, they wouldn't believe it. Uh, anything that was routine to, to an American, they would think I was making up, boasting. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, after a time, the people and the country become one and the same. And that's a bad thing. Well, it was said, and I have heard, and I'm getting in more into the, uh, uh, the humorous aspect of this, but somebody said that Quote, I don't want to set the world on fire, just Tokyo. Who, uh, did you hear that quote, and who was the quoter of those words of wisdom? <laughs> I, I really hadn't heard it, but I think I could tell you who, who probably said it. General LeMay, as you recall. He, LeMay or Le, Doolittle? No, no, General LeMay. LeMay. Yeah, uh, because... He was the commander of the bombing force that was hitting Japan in 1944, oh. 45. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, they started out with conventional bombing. Uh -huh. And this went on for a while, and uh, the results were negligible, really. So General LeMay said this uh, place could, would burn very nicely, mostly paper and wood, the buildings and so on. And so uh, he uh, recommended this change to Washington. I suppose he got approval, and that's when our fire bombing started. And he burned Tokyo almost to the ground. Yeah. So it was not a saying that applied to the Doolittle Way. No. It was something that came later. Right. I see. Well, now, uh, a question. My being a newsman, I would like to ask, were there any reporters included in the raid? No. That takes care of that. <laughs> uh, there's a very good reason for this. We could only take five people. Yeah. So the, every man had two jobs. Yeah. Uh, for example, the, the, the gunner was a mechanic, uh, the uh, navigator was a, also a bombardier, and uh, uh, everybody had something to do. We had a doctor uh, aboard one of the airplanes, but he was a gunner too. He had all the training that you squeeze in in 30 days with machine guns, so he was primarily a gunner until it got on the ground, and uh, uh, he's the one who, who cut the, uh, Lawson's leg off after they landed. Mm -hmm. Well, now, one last question. Uh, do you ever get together with the remnants of the men who were on this two little raid? Yes, we do. We have a, a reunion every year. As a matter of fact, uh, on the 18th of April this year, we met Fort Worth, which is very close here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we meet in different parts of the country. We try to make it easier for people to be able to get there. And we generally uh, meet for two or three days. Mostly it's to renew old friendships. And uh, we have a few ceremonies, things like this. Yes, we do. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ed York, for this interesting, informative, and very historic uh, piece of, of um, literature that you, verbal lit oral literature that you've given us. I certainly appreciate it. This is Jim Sweeney over and out.